Hi, we've just hit 3.30, and we have two very good speakers, so I want to give them as much time as possible. Thanks for coming. I'm Jeff Doherty with Web of Science Group. I've been with that organization for a very long time, back to ISI, if anyone remembers that, and Gene Garfield. Uh, the topic today is extremely important to us. I belong to a group of individuals that are in part, in large part, charged with supporting information literacy at our partner universities. So this is, this is really critically important to us. Uh, what Susan and Linda are going to speak about are two quite different kinds of events, but both, uh, both supported by us and, and other organizations that do similar, similar things to what we do. Uh, with that, let me introduce our two speakers. Susan Walt Berkman. Susan is the Assistant Director of Collection Development and Technical Services at the Alvin Sherman Library Research and Information Technology Center at Nova Southeastern University, located in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. She started out as a subject specialist for business at NSU and has her own information services business, research ability. Her other professional experience was as the research director for First Marketing Progressive Impressions International, and she's been a librarian for 30 years. Our second speaker, Linda Kopecki. Linda is the head of research services right down front here. <laughs> Linda's the head of research services at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, a public urban R1 research university. She leads initiatives to support UWM's overall research environment through advanced library services, collections, and facilities. Linda currently serves as counselor at large for ALA. Her professional research interests include information literacy and graduate education, and documenting the value of academic libraries. And again, I want to give as much time to our speakers. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Susan. So um, I'm going to be talking about Power Publishing Day, which is a, um, an event that I started five years ago at um, NSU after I was there about a year. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk through how that came to be, where it's part of our workshop series, and all the details on how we actually make it happen through the whole thing. So um, NOVA um, is a private nonprofit university in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, we are joint use facilities. So our library is also open to the public and we have public library services within our library. Um, it makes a very interesting uh, community because we really are a community library. They, um, if you live, work, or go to school in our county, you can get a public card for NOVA, but you, it's not the same as your regular county library card. So they have access to all of our resources um, some even remotely. So when I um, first started there as a business subject specialist, I was at um, probably SLA that, at that time, and I was talking with um, Ruth Wolfish, she's from IEEE. We were friends, and I was telling her about the roles, and we had these workshops, and she says, you know, it'd be really cool if you did something with publishing, because that's kind of the thing when you're, I went from corporate uh, libraries to now academic, and being published was a, a pretty big deal. And she kind of gave me a little bit of an outline, and um, I said, okay, I, I think I, I'm going to try something like that. So I um, wrote a proposal to our um, university librarian, and it was turned down not once, not twice, <laughs> not three times, but the fourth time, finally, um, it got approved. Um, basically, they thought it was a little ambitious, um, but that didn't scare me off. Um, so what we had been doing in the past was we had um, faculty workshops. They were just for faculty. They were done by the librarians. We had we have four li libraries on campus. I'm at the main library. We have a health profession division library. We have an oceanographic center library because we're in Fort Lauderdale. Um, and we also have a law library. So those were all, we had subject specialists from those areas. We had um, different people from the different libraries were on this committee and they would meet at the beginning of the semester, figure out a couple of things they were going to talk about, and then we just kind of marketed it out there. Um, 
it was okay, it was working okay, but we decided that, um, you know, it might be better um, if we planned out a calendar for the year and then we could market that. So I uh, noticed the picture there and I have some samples up here, but we actually made a big postcard and put the whole schedule for the year on there, including Power Publishing Day, so that people, those staff and faculty could mark their calendars as, you know, look at that, I can put this on my calendar now because, you know, how they can't always make it at the last minute and um, yeah. this kind of helped promote that. So the first step was actually to contact publishers and see if they would be willing to partner with us on this. And um, we were very lucky in the beginning. I think the first one we had six publishers to begin with, and we've added, um, it's now we have, because of the space reasons, we can have up to eight. Um, and we asked them from being a, to be a sponsor. And what did, what did they get in their sponsorship? They got, um, <coughs> they got a table that would, they could sit at all day where they could talk to people and people would come up to them. Um, they, um, the money went towards providing breakfast and lunch. So all of you who work in a library, you know that food always brings people to the library or <laughs> any kind of program. Um, and we had snacks one year. And so um, th the whole idea was that they couldn't, they could present something on publishing, but it couldn't be a sales pitch. So the idea is don't promote your product. We're talking here about the good of publishing. And so um, th they were very open to that. Um, they could decide what they wanted to talk about in publishing, and whoever gave me that idea first got it. So sometimes, you know, people mollygag around trying to talk, figure out what they're going to talk about. Um, then they have time to figure out which editor they want to send. So maybe, you know, maybe it's a book editor, maybe it's a, a, a um, journal editor, depending on what it was. And we tried to then switch things up. So these are some of the topics that we've covered in the last four. Um, we try not to have the same topic twice. Uh, after the first year, we found out that the, um, the faculty in the Literature and Writing Center was very upset that they weren't invited to participate. So that was corrected the second time we did this. And they actually talked about um, getting your what to do with your dissertation. That was a question that came up all the time. We're he we are very heavy in the graduate school population. And they would come up and, you know, now I did this all this work, can I get it published or take parts of it and publish it, and how can I do that? So um, that was one of the ideas that they came up with to work for that. So once you have all that, your topics and everything, the, one of the first things you do is you have to pick a date. So Florida in January, it's pretty wonderful, to, especially people who don't live in Florida. So that was a really popular time to choose because most of the publishers were coming from all over where it was cold. Um, so um, we do it at the end of January. It's usually the fourth. Um, the fourth week in January this year because I, there's a, a conflict with ALA and it was last year too. We moved it to the last one. Um, and we have a... Uh, I don't know about your libraries, but our conference rooms have been, it's very hard to hold a meeting anywhere anymore because you can't find three conference rooms. So we start booking those rooms like uh, six months out. And we, um, we have a, we're very lucky, we have a beautiful gallery in our library. So um, that's the initial space where we have everybody meet and do keynotes and things like that. And then we book three other big conference rooms. And then we need to choose a speaker. So the logical choice in our um, case was um, the provost, who is the one who's pushing um, getting published, right? So that's what their, their big job is, working with the faculty and getting that done. So um, we spoke the first year, and then we've had since uh, one of our professors who is in education, but he has he's like the editor of several journals, and he really knows the publishing field well, and he's great. And it, that speech is 15 minutes. It's not like it's not taking up the whole day. It's just kind of an intro, get everybody warmed up for what's following after that. Um, we work with our systems department because we 
Um, we stream it when we're, uh, we do actually use GoToMeeting at the uh, time that we're doing it. So there's live, there's, uh, you can uh, participate online, or you can request the recording at the end of it. So we, we have our um, systems people set, get everything set up and get them on board for that day so that we pretty much have dedicated systems people that day, which is awesome. And about a month before we open um, registration, and what we collect, and we use Lib surveys for that, and uh, we get the name and their email, um, and then we ask them to pick the ones, the sessions they want to go to because we have to plan for food. Um, so, um, and what, the way we organize it is that we have each publisher has two sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So someone who's coming could go to four sessions in a day, four different ones, or if they just have the morning, they can go to two, or if they just have the afternoon, they can go to two, or they can come before lunch and after lunch, whatever it works for their schedule, but they, you know, this way, um, the publishers don't have to do too many, but they're presenting it twice and it allows more people to take advantage of that. Um, so we, as I said, we collect their uh, name and their email this is now open to faculty, staff, students, our alumni, and the public. So it's, it's really out there. Um, they have to identify themselves, and if they are with NOVA, we want to know um, which college they're with as well, because we're tracking all of that. Um, they pick their sessions, they answer whether they're coming to lunch or not, and then they choose um, to let us know whether they're coming in person or online, um, or if you're requesting the recording. And then we do marketing. Um, and we are very fortunate that we have a marketing director um, in our library who helps promote all of our um, events. Um, so they start off usually with a save the date. We have it in um, print, but we also get an e-bite for that and we start pushing it out. I mean, I started letting the business faculty know like in, in August that save this date now because we already know what's going on. Um, we do postcards, we have e-bites, we have e-news. Um, there's an e-newsletter that goes out to all of uh, the um, constituents. We have the marquee, we <clears throat> use the, the student newspaper, the uh, local newspaper, uh, posters and things like that, social media, of course, and then we ask other um, in our area to promote as well. We're part of the Southeast Florida Library Information Network, so they help promote it as well. Um, and then we also ask the vendors to market. We haven't been very successful with that, um, but we keep asking them to do that. And then the day of, so everyone gets a name tag, and uh, we have a program, and I have some up here that you can take a look at and see what we do. And uh, then we also have signage going in there, we have a registration desk, we have a whole desk gallery, as you can see on the far right is set up as uh, we have 10 like round tables so we kind of see for about 100 we've been getting about 100 to 125 people every year you can see the spread for lunch and make sure we have options for everybody as much as we can and then they're in the classrooms doing their um you know sessions and usually leaving like 15 minutes in between that and so uh, see if these are some of the lessons learned um the first year we had the vendors inside the gallery and we found out that they wanted to be outside. They actually, so that people could see them, that were in the library, just except when they're, you know, studying or whatever. So we moved them to outside of that area. We put the individual, their, what they signed up for a schedule on the back of their name tag, because nobody remembers a month later what they signed up for. It helps, they can change. It doesn't lock them into that, but it's kind of a nice idea for them. Um, we get the presentations from the vendors ahead of time so that our systems guys can have it loaded and ready and you don't have to, they don't have to worry that as a technical issue. Um, we, have, we know who's registered for recordings and again the IT involvement from the beginning. Our limit is six to eight vendors, scheduling it early. We do evaluations for the whole day for our attendees, but we also do evaluations to the vendors to make sure that they feel they got value from that experience. Um, and then again, involving faculty as much as we can so that we get them to come. 
And then this is kind of the benefits of what's, what's in it for me. So there's great relationships built between our librarians and our vendors, um, also collaboration with faculty and just the community because we're inviting them in. Um, the authors get to meet publishers, which is usually doesn't happen. They're, however they submit things, it doesn't really work that way. Um, they so now they have faces and they can ask people questions. Showcases our library, um, we promote our databases and um, they can talk to some of about product awareness when they're at their tables. Um, just goodwill for everyone. And then our next Power Publishing Day is set for January 30th of this year. And I think that's perfect time. If you don't mind, we'll hold questions to the end. Thank you. And I'm going to, I feel like we're moving. <laughs> so uh, let's just do that. There we go. There we go. Okay. Hi, I'm Linda Kubecki from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And I'm head of the research services team at UWM, and one of the many hats that we wear is the need to special deliver specialized research services. And that includes you know, the need to, we have some bullet points to connect campus researchers to library resources. And we're spending all that money, you guys are spending all that money acquiring things for us at this conference. And then sometimes we don't get return on that investment because people aren't knowing to use the sources. We have, um, part of our mission is to educate graduate students, faculty, and campus researchers on a whole lot of things. Again, optimize those research collections, the e resources that we do have. And then to do really proactive promotion of research tools, collections, and services. There's only four of us in the research services team. We had a reorganization a couple years ago, so we went from a large um, research and instructional support department with 14, 15 of us to, for the specialized purpose, only four people. And we have many more hats besides this as far as subject specialties. But these are just some of the things that we're leading off on for this particular topic. So under that category of proactive promotion of research tools, collections, and services, we have a couple different target groups. We started out with faculty and staff, um, teaching assistants, graduate students in general, but then we stretched into the Office of Undergraduate Research for support for undergraduate students. We actually have a very robust Office of Undergraduate Research um, on campus, and the SURF program is students who are undergraduate research fellows who work with faculty. They get paid um, for that. And so very often those undergrads are actually out there publishing and looking for publishing opportunities. And then we also do um, just work with individual academic units for um, research support as well. So in general, in addition to the programming, um, we do a lot of you know, sort of the faculty orientations, do graduate student orientations, all of those things that probably a lot of you um, are working on. But workshops and programs are a little piece of that. So this is too small, but that's okay. This is our old model. For years, I tried to do what I was calling the teaching and research series for the faculty and instructors and the graduate research series for the grad school. Anything from you know building tours, because it's a pretty big place, about so nine acres of building. Um, we have one here, cyber cheating, helping students avoid plagiarism in a full text world. The TAs were asking for that. Um, journal alerts delivered to your email. This is an old thing, so that used to be you know the hot, fancy thing, not same old. But in reality, we would put these workshops out, we had a nice little brochure, we would announce them ahead of time. But even though my campus has, you know, 30,000 bodies on it, but get eight people, 12 people, nine people, you know, maybe 20 people would sign up, 10 of those would show up and get two or three more walk-ins. And so it just didn't seem like a lot of benefit for all of the planning. And we kept rerunning the same topics because those are ones my folks would do, and I would get specialized people in to teach things about like what's so special about special collections when they only got five people they didn't want to do it again right so we had to find a new model so along the way um, we we're trying to figure out what is the secret to getting people to attend so really no secret look upside down the secret to our attendance same as at Susan it's food <laughs> especially graduate students fruit fresh fruit 
and uh, probably Sardan Muslim students, bacon. The power of bacon on the Milwaukee <laughs> campus was <laughs> not to be under, underscored. So the, we actually started out with cupcakes. And this was an idea, we had Data Planet come in. We had recently acquired the Data Planet data sets. Um, Richard Landry, if you know him, I think he's probably at this conference, he likes cupcakes. And um, we put out in our actual announcement, part of the promotion, you know, as a special treat, we're gonna offer fabulous cupcakes from Ms. Cupcakes Boutique Bakery, it's right around the corner from campus. And it's known for these cupcakes where like the cupcake is three inches and then the frosting is three inches. And <laughs> students were like, oh my goodness, you know, Miss Cupcake. And people did actually come in and register and then say, where are the cupcakes? <laughs> they really did come for the cupcakes. <laughs> Which is, they are good cupcakes. Um, so with Data Planet, we actually did three different sessions. One was a business and economics um, focused session. We did one that was social welfare focused and one that was um, poli-sci focused. Those are the focuses for the specialties for my team. Right? So we picked program uh, emphasis that, that worked with our departments. But across those three sessions, we ended up having uh, more than 50 people headcount, and some stayed for all three sessions because we were emphasizing different data sets in the three sessions. So we're like, wow, I just went from 8, 10, 12 to, you know, more, more than 50. So, and it was everything. We had TAs, faculty, and they mixed up. The common wisdom had always been you need a teaching series and a grad student series because they don't want to mix. But in reality, the faculty were always asking if they could come to the grad student series, or why aren't you offering it for us? They mixed up just fine in this session. So it was very positive, and in reality, um, most of them said they'd been completely unaware of Data Planet as a product, and we did then ask them feedback, how will you use this? And they came up with, oh, my personal research, and they told us their projects, or I'm going to incorporate this into my curriculum. So we were able to you know, find people who had, you know, told us that they were going to use this and um, you know, we really had raised their awareness. So access to e-resources and utilizing those and this whole letting people um, have more knowledge about academic and scholarly publishing, those are kind of the two themes. So the next event we did was Getting Published, Your Articles Journal, Journey to Discovery, which was a Marianne Liebert sponsored program. And for those of you who don't know, Marianne Liebert does, um, they're known for, I think, medical, biomedical kinds of sources. Um, but they weren't, you know, a huge name. And so um, their trainer came and did a very detailed sort of nuts to bolts step-by-step -step publishing process. So you want to be a published author, this is what it takes. From truly, um, you know, just your idea through discovery all the way to publication. You know, how does the manuscript process work? So that was very successful. It was perfect for grad students and also some of those undergrads who were new to publishing. Um, we had examples of like the different forms of things um, that they could look at to you know know what they were going to get asked for, and it really definitely raised awareness of Mary Liebert as a publishing option. And the graduate school loved it enough that they have something called Grad 801, which doctoral students can take, and if they do a certain number of modules, they can get like one credit or two credits or three credits. And the grad school said, oh, any of our <coughs> students who come to this, it can go towards their modular credit. And that actually has continued with support. And as you can see, yes, we had good, we had lovely food. <laughs> so the next one we did was Publish Not Perish, Ins and Outs of Scholarly Publishing and Getting Discovered, Springer Nature sponsored. Um, that one we had a breakfast workshop, more than 50 registered. And Springer Nature, you see a much bigger name, um, in academe than uh, Marion Liebert, in this case, the grad school said, oh, this, this is fantastic. From here on out, we have blanket approval. Anything I show, anything students can register for, their grad students can get credit. So that having that it's sort of endorsement by the graduate school is you know, priceless. And what we ended up doing there is um, Springer Nature did a really terrific condensed presentation about Springer and publications and we had lists ahead of time they were able to supply me a spreadsheet of all the faculty on my campus who had a springer nature connection whether they were authors editors of a journal um, maybe a chapter of a book an enormous spreadsheet so i actually picked springer authors that we did a faculty panel so after the springer part i we had the faculty panel go and these are actually distinguished this is the chair of the social work department and somebody from our biomedical engineering department these were well-known, well-respected faculty who came to be part of our panel. 
that actually turned into be such a good format because I really love the faculty panel. They were so generous with their time and their expertise that Springer now shares that as their recommended format. So if they come to your town, they'll say, we'll do a piece and then get a, a local faculty panel to pair up. That's their new recommended format because it works so well. So the next one we did was beyond journal publishing because I had people saying, well, wait, this is all about medical, biomedical, science. What about us book people? So we looked for a book publisher and Sage, which obviously does both, generously offered to sponsor beyond journal publishing. They were going to do a little piece and then a faculty panel. Um, and then actually the Sage speaker needed to be out of the country that day. So they just generously sponsored us and we put their name on things and they had no physical presence. Um, and so in place of that, actually, the chair of the history department gave up what we were calling a little keynote. And she is an amazing library supporter, um, also an urban studies faculty member, and that's one of my areas again. Um, and she has both published her own you know, books. She's been a book editor. She's right now um, an editor of the Encyclopedia of Milwaukee, which is an online encyclopedia. So broad perspectives. And also has many advisees under her. And we were just saying, you know, both share your story of how, you know, what did you learn along the way, including the pitfalls, and she was fabulous for that, just willing to be out there and approachable and share, and then also how, what are you advising your own students um, when they're looking to publish, because in history it still is very book heavy. So we did follow that though, oh, so we had in that case a um, taco lunch, and so it spice up your summer research, we did that actually on study day leaning into summer, and so spice up your summer research was because we had taco lunch. And um, that was followed by a panel, and that's also a very distinguished panel with people who had published with SAGE to do um, encyclopedias, book publishing, um, the dean of the Peck School of the Arts was on our panel. So again, very generous and um, high-powered group that um, were willing to share their time and their expertise. So the next one we had actually, Jeff came in and he did fall into research. And so with fall into research, there was so much content in the third at Web of Science platform with all the specialty tools and all that sort of, I think of as spin-off products that are embedded in the Web of Science database that we did a little bit of a spin. We uh, actually had three programs. So the green is at the bottom that was intended for undergrads, right? They're sort of green in publishing world. And for that, we did them in the afternoon with ice cream treats because that's what our Office of Research suggested. For our lunch, we actually had um, a graduate student, um, doctoral students, closing in on 60 of them um, event. And then we actually started off the day with a faculty breakfast. So in that case, Jeff was fantastic in sort of tailoring you know, for undergrads, it's about discovery and how you can use this for, you know, your research and also getting to know your, like, your advisor's work or maybe using Web of Science to identify graduate school or something. Factoral student supports where to publish, manuscript script matchers, funding opportunities that you can identify, you know, through, through Web of Science. So that was a different model for us because we didn't have the faculty panel because there was so much other that we could, we could fold in there. And again, the positive feedback was people overwhelmingly had new awareness of specialized tools. They had no idea of the depth of what you could get out of the Web of Science database. So last May, our, we had an event, Academic Publishing with IEEE, so that was Energize Your Research with a nod towards IEEE's historic uh, uh, background as a, an intellectual engineering uh, database. And um, that one, we would did go back to our faculty model where IEEE gave a fabulous presentation as to why IEEE is a very multidisciplinary database now. It's not all electrical engineering. A key thing there is we were also promoted by the, the UWM IEEE student chapter. They put it out on their Facebook page. And it turned out there was actually, um, at engineering that same morning, they had a really fancy event going sponsored by Rockwell Engineering. And one of the presenters, um, the chair of the electrical engineering department was on our panel. He said, oh, sorry, that's competing. And I said, I had to close this event early. We were full. We were at capacity. So it didn't matter if we had a competing event. We still had a very successful event, more than 66 registered. And again, a scholarly panel there. So that has really been um, our model so far. We have an event coming up in two weeks. And actually, we've tapped Clara Web of Science to come back. We have a new campus. Two campuses that previously weren't part of my school have been folded into the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. 
So we're going to be um, having a different trainer, one of Jeff's colleagues, Marissa, is coming out. And we're going to do sort of the undergrad discovery um, session, and then lunch, and then an afternoon sort of advanced why you could use Web of Science for advanced research or curricular projects and that kind of thing. So we'll see how that goes, but we're using that both to raise awareness of the product, but also to be sort of a welcome to the UWM libraries. We're going to do an event on your campus. You don't actually have to drive the 45 minutes and look for parking on the main campus um, event. And so registration actually just opened up for that on Monday. Um, one of the things Susan mentioned was marketing. So we, of course, we have LCD slides, um, you know, around campus, our most popular place when we say, where did you hear of this? The LCD above the line for the coffee shop, right? Because they're in that line for a minute, five minutes, ten minutes. A lot of people see us at the coffee shop sign. But we have managed to get flyers into key other areas for electrical engineering. They were just every floor of electrical engineering, of the engineering building had flyers. Um, Facebook posts on campus. We go into provost announcements. Every Monday our provost sends out of what's happening on campus. Usually they'll only do events with short timeline, but we've convinced them I need a longer timeline because of the food deadline. <laughs> so we go to provost announcements. Um, the graduate school now, they have an e-newsletter, and so they will take my flowers and my announcements and blast them out through their e-newsletter to all the graduate students on campus. And of course, still give those grad students um, in grad 801 modular credit. So it's just really been a very successful um, model for us. And doing it sort of piece by piece, I think, is something that any library could just take and try once, right? Just find the publisher, pick a date, do one of these. If it works, do another one. As with Susan, though, we have some lessons learned and things that have been really useful. Our last couple of events, we built a companion lib guide so that they don't always have to go back to databases A to Z or something. Um, that points to the tools and the resources and the who to go for help and the tutorials and the help guides. So many of our vendors have amazing you know, um, help products out there. Why make them look for those? We package those into a libguide now for our extended impact. We always have done ahead of time an awareness queue, like how familiar are you with this database or resource? And then afterwards, we always do a post. You know, do you think you might use this for your research or some other reason? You know, tell us more. And so we have that assessment information. We do, of course, share with our sponsors. Um, and it really is successful because of our partnerships and our sponsorships. You know, we just get um, good support from the Graduate School, the Office of Research, the Office of Undergraduate Research, the one that we did with Clara the last time, we pushed out through the Honors College. Now, these are groups who want their students to succeed and have a good um, mailing list, good connections with those students. If they advise it, you know, students will show up because they're high achieving students. As with Susan, I would definitely say start early. Be careful with your calendaring. Make sure you are not hitting a national holiday for a religious or ethnic group that might not be your own. <laughs> Make sure you're calendaring um, smartly. Talk to your, your budget rep as far as what kind of funding can you accept and are there limits, <coughs> that kind of thing. Um, every single sponsor we've had so far says, oh, let me know if you want us to come back next year. So it does make me think, well, maybe I could jump, jump to Susan's model, but I kind of like having it one publisher at a time or one database provider at a time. But I would definitely encourage you to borrow our format. It certainly is working. You can borrow any of our promotional materials, our outlines, or anything. And um, publishers are eager to do this. I mean, I have a list in spring already. It's going, um, Gail's going to come in and talk about primary source databases because, again, we don't want to always focus on journal publishing. So this is just a wrap-up of the ones I've talked about. And the, I put the funding amounts on here because we're not talking big money, right? You can do an awful lot of nice programming for two, three hundred dollars And it's so appreciated on our campus. And again, food brings them in, but honestly, now that we have a reputation, we did last year hit on, um, it was Ramadan, I think, during the time period, and I didn't carefully calendar. I just had a lot of people, when I said, you know, dietary restrictions, they just said, I won't be eating, but I'll be there. Mm -hmm. So once you get a reputation, people come even when it's not all about the food. So I think that's how you know you're successful. <laughs> so thank you so very much, and let us know. Thank you. So we do have time for some questions. I wanted to uh, just circle back to the title of this presentation. 
uh, leading them to water, imploring them to drink. And so we know, as, as someone in our position who does the partnering, you can work really hard at things, and sometimes they're just not successful based on all these little factors, <coughs> timing, food, those kinds of things. And these are really two very successful events. And so I wanted to just you know, point to that title. They, they, they put a lot of work into it, and these events were great. And so any questions at all? Steal their stuff. <laughs> yes. yes. I would just like to add that this Power Publishing Day is a one-day event, but it's in the realm of other events that we do maybe monthly that are just focused on a database. Um, and we usually do it at lunchtime mm -hmm. um, so that we have food there. But, um, you know, and we rotate the places that we have it. So we, maybe we're pushing something like being in our institutional repository or, um, you know, not necessarily anything about publishing, but uh, how to save your students money. So different things like that. And um, again, just having the calendar all at once is, is, has been really successful for us. Can I throw a question? Oh, go ahead. These both sound really fascinating. Yeah, both of like the way you ran it, for getting food in, how you got students there. How did you make the time to build this into all of the other stuff that I'm sure you're doing? You were short staffed, so how did that go? There is no time. <laughs> <laughs> Our event in two weeks. It went out Monday, it published announcements. I was at the Baltimore airport when I pushed it out to the library contacts to say, get it out there, put it in your SIG files. The Office of Undergraduate Research emailed me back saying she would push it out to her students. We have a very detailed checklist for our marketing plan, which is now up to like 20 opportunities, places we will post it and push it, and that kind of thing. And I'm happy to share that as well. So every event that we do, we just keep building on the checklist with little tweaks. But now there is no extra time, and it wasn't evident from needing sponsorship. We also have zero budget. We start with zero, mm -hmm. and so that's that's it. Yeah, it's a no answer. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you just do more than you're already doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do you ever do anything that's not special? Like um, when I was in grad school, I had a research class that I was required to take, and it was the best class I had. I wished I had had it as an undergraduate first. Everybody should have taken it, mm -hmm. and I couldn't understand why you had to wait so long. To take it. <laughs> but and and then later on, when I taught, I um, would have the librarians come in, you know, and do a program in my class, um, so that you get more than just those fifty. Maybe you get the stragglers that wouldn't come <laughs> or couldn't come outside of class time. Yeah. So yeah, of course. Yeah, our, our traditional information literacy classes at um, UWM at least, I know are on the five, six hundred a year number. So of course, the, when people would bring their classes in, it's a whole different animal. And then I had mentioned that Gray on the 801 class, and we do sessions for them outside of this on topics like copyright and how to find the right place to publish and um, citations and other other topics that they usually request. You know, sometimes they're just about rough works. Yeah. Um, so we, we do the okay. course integrated instruction somewhere in the 600 number um, and then uh, specialty topics as well. Yeah. yeah. So this and is just your free time. This is just extra. <laughs> yeah. I was saying, um, Nova Southeastern, we started having um, the first year experience. Mm -hmm. So when uh, freshmen come in, they actually have a whole curriculum of things that they need to do. Some of it is taught by librarians, some of it is taught by faculty, but there is a information literacy mm -hmm. portion in there. Um, and we, uh, especially in the undergraduates, get a lot of requests for, I mean, they're so booked, that's all the reference librarians are doing pretty much at the beginning of the semester for so many classes, the bio, intro to bio classes, um, their comp classes, and then in the graduate school, it happens as it happens to. I know I've done some like within the first two weeks of class, mm -hmm. so it's in there as well. Yeah, that's just separate on top of the other mm -hmm. things. Right. <laughs> We are exactly on time. Wow. So, uh, <laughs>